So you found the tournament schedule. Now, how do you figure out what the first tournament you're going to sign up for is? That sounds complicated, right? Uh, yeah, it is a little complicated. And so the first suggestion is, is if you're having trouble in any way, shape, or form, reach out to me via Slack. Ask for a suggest. Ask for advice. And I can help find what that best tournament is for you. Uh, this legendary, this legend spot kind of describes what the various columns are in the uh, actual spreadsheet schedule that's in the next column. And so if you want a little bit more detail explaining some of these things, uh, you can look at this and kind of get that detail. But I'm kind of going to go rough through rough, some rough columns. And so here is the tournament schedule. It goes, you know, there's a lot of data to kind of look at. Um, I'm kind of going to go through the most important stuff. So important stuff are as kind of as follows. Uh, the tournament name, meaning the institution that's hosting it, whether, you know, it's a high school or it's a college. Uh, where their host city is. Now we're not traveling to that city but it lets you know kind of the time zone they're operating in and you can kind of expect some tournaments are adjusting to sort of a more centralized time zone. Um, some tournaments are just sticking to wherever their host time zone is. And so that's something to be wary of as well. Uh, when the dates are, when the first it starts, when it ends, what week it is of the calendar year, when the tournaments are the day of the week. D is debate, S is speech, C is Congress. So for example, University of Kentucky, Congress might only be two days, speech only two days, whereas debate is three days because it carries over from Monday. If you see an asterisk, that lets you know that not all debate events are that day, just some of them. So Green Hill, for example, might just be, for example, policy on Monday and not LD, which ends on Sunday. And so that's something to think about as well. So if you're someone that has like a Friday class they can't miss or a Monday class they can't ever miss, uh, it's something to think about the schedule, picking your tournament. Uh, these last days are usually elimination days, and so you have to qualify for them. And so if you're not one of the top teams qualifying for them, then you are not participating that day, and so you can still probably go to class. Is there a round robin associated with that tournament? This kind of lets you know ones that I know of. When is the permission slip due? When you need to turn it in to Corey Lane to the front office. Now again, you usually have about one week after permission slip, but after that one, there's no promises even in that one week, but after that one week, the promises get less, you know, the likelihood gets less and less the longer you wait. And so signing up early is the best thing to do. And if you sign up before the due date, you can always drop up into the due date with a guarantee zero cost whatsoever. Now, if you drop after the due date, and you've already turned in the form, now you owe sunk costs. And sunk costs basically mean whatever we cannot recover. If we've already paid the tournament and they said no refunds, if we've already agreed to hire a coach, we can't say sorry because they've already committed to us. They could have committed to someone else, but they didn't. And so those situations where you've already made commitments, those are sunk costs. And even if you drop, you are paying those fees. However, if we haven't made those commitments or if the drop date hasn't happened yet on Tavern, we can go through and drop you and then those costs that you would owe would be go all the way down to potentially zero if we have no sunk costs. And so that's the way you should be interpreting the due date. These best eight, best seven columns. So these are the tournaments that are generally going to be the best in the nation for your division, or your event rather. So if you're a PFer, these are the weekends and the tournaments that have the best eight plus PF tournaments of the nation that you should think about. These are the ones if you're varsity you want to sign up for to go to compete at. They are the hardest, but they're also going to be where you learn the most and get the best and improve the most in. And so I highly recommend you kind of coalesce your schedule from sort of this idea, but this is just a rough template. If certain weekends don't work for you and some others really do, try to mix those in as well. And so this is just a starting point, not an ending point of the discussion. It's also sort of like eight's a great sort of like gold standard. If you're doing eight a year, you're doing great. If you're doing more than eight, that's fantastic. If you're doing less than eight, that's also good. The requirement to be on the team is one throughout the year, which means that makes someone a member and makes them valuable contribution to the team. Anything beyond that is gravy, and so just think about adding it more as an addition rather than having to take off stuff as losing stuff. There's also sort of the looking at what if you're a novice? What if it's your first year? So if you're a high school novice, we have a similar recommendation of tournaments where we can place you in divisions where you compete against other first year students. Um, so you're not necessarily thrown against someone who's in their third or fourth year. Uh, not every novice tournament or every tournament allows middle schoolers. And so there are some novice tournaments that are high schools, some that are for middle school, some that are for both. And so that's why we have two columns here for how to approach this. Uh, what ev uh, ev events they offer, I'm sorry, what divisions they offer in debate and speech? Are they offering middle school, novice, JV, open divisions? Um, 
you don't necessarily need to pay about much attention to this because sometimes a tournament's open division might be worse than another tournament's JV division, or their you know uh, you know novice division might be filled with a bunch of people that are functionally you know open. Um, so don't worry about division as much. I'll try to place you where you are at skill level where I think you will fit best. And so uh, for what events you do, debate speech, Congress, it tells you kind of what the visions were that were listed on tablet. What the weekend preference is. So this is if you sign up for a tournament that weekend or a tournament that weekend in an event, and there, there say there are two tournaments both offering PF one weekend. Which one am I going to push you in? And so this lets you know that you know if, for example, let's say Florida is the same weekend as UOP, you are going to be doing. Let's scroll down. So Florida right here, PF UOP, no preferences. And so if you sign up for UOP, I'm going to say, let's think about, and it's for PF, let's think about going to Florida instead. Because in my mind, that is the tournament that is going to be much better for you, and it helps us to coalesce everyone at the same tournament rather than different tournaments. And so this preference kind of lets you know where you'll be placed if you need to be placed in a particular uh, spot. The next column lets you know if their middle school entries are allowed. Uh, a lot of the question marks are ones we don't know yet, but you should generally assume the answer is yes. Um, my experience, most programs say, oh yeah, it's fine. There's only a few that have rules that permit that say they can't do it. Um, so the next column is, is it confirmed for 2021? Uh, most tournaments, I think, pretty much every tournament in the fall, most actually, not every, but most in the fall have been confirmed for 2021. Um, some are still being confirmed. And so once they confirm and once they confirm they're online, they will be officially be available to sign up for. And so those are things to think about as well. Um, what platform are they going to run it on? As I said, it's generally NSDA campus or classrooms.cloud. And so this kind of lets the student know what platform they'll be on. How it's being administrated for ballots and pairings and things like that. As you'll see, uh, Tab Room pretty much has a monopoly at this point. Is it going to be live for IE? So IE is weird. Some tournaments are doing it where you submit a video in advance. Some tournaments are saying, no, you have to perform live at the tournament in front of a judge. Some terms are saying most are live or none are live, but some are going to be, and some have different rules here or there. And so this kind of lets you know to plan, is this tournament going to be one that you're submitting a video in advance, or is it going to be one in which you actually have to show up and perform your piece multiple times that weekend? Does the tournament allow impromptu duo? As we talked about, not all tournaments do this year, and so this kind of lets you know uh, what, they're, what they're offering uh, for the tournament. What the tab room name is. Sometimes the tournaments have weird names, not actually what they're called from a school perspective. And so you might have to search this name on tab room to find a specific tournament so you can look up more information. Is there any other specific info that you should know about? It'll be in this column. Costs. Costs are taken from tab room. Um, they're estimates, so they can always be adjusted by the tournament. Somewhat down usually is what they've been doing. Um, but you know, as the closer ones are a little bit more fixed. And as they come available, I will put them and try to place them in here. <laughs> And so this will tell you what the cost is, including the $100 judging fee, the total cost. So that $10 bucks plus entry fees plus $100, bucks, this is what it is. And so if you subtract that $100, then that's what your fee is if you did the judge waiver approach or if you did the minimal entry approach. The average cost is kind of an average cost between events, and so you, we have an idea of what to put on that form we sent out. Uh, everything beyond here is kind of up for the students just to kind of look at to know it's less useful for the parents. It tells you how many TOC bids are at the particular tournament. Uh, for a lot of events. Uh, generally, the more bids, the more popular the tournament is, which means the better the tournament's going to be. And so that kind of helped dictate which tournaments we're trying to have students sign up for. Uh, so Parley's a little bit different. They, do, they don't do bids. They just do entry size. And so it lets you know in previous years how many entries they had at their particular tournament. And it kind of lets you know which tournaments are super small versus which ones are super big. And so right there, that, and then the last, and then whether they can sign up or not right now. And so that is the tournament schedule in, in a nutshell. Generally, students should be starting to think, okay, what's my event? When's the first one that matches up? Can I turn in the permission slip? Probably it's late, but maybe I can still get away with it. Maybe I email Dr. Thiele. Can I go that weekend? If I can go that weekend, maybe do it. And so that's the general thought process to start thinking about where in your schedule does it line up and start to turn in permission slips and we can kind of go there and start organizing it from there. And so hopefully this helps you understand the tournament schedule. It can be a little complicated. If you want to have any specific questions, feel free to Slack me and I'd be very happy to go through all this in more detail, of course.